All right, great. All right, thanks. Welcome everyone for the next session of this um, seminar on quantum foundations. So today we've got Guillermo Franzman talking about uh, quantum reference frames and quantum subsystems and their invariants. So when mm -hmm. you're ready. Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm happy to keep it very informal. So if anyone has any question, we're not that many, so it would be even nicer if we just stop and try to make sure we're following what's happening. Um, hopefully it's going to be somewhat pedagogical anyways. Um, but okay, so today we're talking about quantum subsystems and to which extent we can see them as invariant and what do I mean by invariant and what I mean by subsystems and quantum. Um, this talk is mostly inspired on a recent paper I put out, uh, which is uh, at the bottom of the page. So if you want to have a look on on the talk with much more details, uh, please have a look on that. Um, okay, so to get us started, uh, <clears throat> we're going to think about a little story and try to make sense of what's going on there. Um, so we're going to think about a mysterious box. And the context, you should imagine yourself arriving at your lab, and there is a mystery box in your lab. And you try to open it, but you're unable to do that. But the box has a display uh, in which there is an energy spectrum that you can play with. So you have different options, and you can see all the different energies of the system that's inside of the box. And so you are very good theoretical physicist and experimentalist. Um, and there you can see that's a story because I'm not sure how many of us are really good at both uh, ends. But you go ahead, ahead and you try to model whatever is inside the box. And you start off very simply. You have your um, smallest component for the system. You think of a spin site. As you know, when you have a spin site, you can think of three different orientations. And when you have a spin site, uh, you know that you can do different things with it. Um, you can couple neighboring spins with some coupling uh, J. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah, cool. Yeah. So you can couple with some particular coupling strength. Say you can coupling the two sides in a particular direction with some J uh, um, strength. Or you can also induce some magnetic field, external magnetic field on your spin side, and then you can couple that with the uh, spin observable representing a particular direction, say uh, SZ now uh, is coupled with the magnetic field H on that direction. And so by using those kind of like legal blocks, you come up with a particular um, model. And in this case, in particular for our example, you decide to couple every uh, different neighbors. You postulate that there are only four spin sites inside of the box. Every two neighbors are coupled with strength J. And you also say that there is a magnetic field on the Z direction affecting all the spin sites. And voila, you get exactly the energy spectrum that you observed when you were playing with the uh, box display. So it's quite exciting. I mean, you, you somehow nailed the you think you nailed whatever is inside of the box because of course you were, you were able to reproduce the full energy spectrum of, uh, that's the box it's telling you uh, of what's inside of it. Anyway, so of course that's exciting. And you go and you call a friend and you tell your friend the story of the mysterious box and how you were able to model what's inside of it. And then you try to tell your friend what you how you modeled what's inside of the box but your friend also wants to, to give it a shot and so they tell you to stop because they want to think by themselves of what could be the system inside of the box so they go away and they try to think about a model and surprised they also arrive at a model of what's inside of the box they also make a modeling in which you can couple neighboring spin sites and having different magnetic fields but your friend's model is a bit different so first of all the coupling between the different neighbors is given by H, which actually was your magnetic field in your model. Um, and now the magnetic field for your friend actually has an X component acting on a few of the spin sites with the J coefficient 
that you had used for the neighboring coupling. And they still have a magnetic field on the spin site one with the H strength that you had before. Nonetheless, they get the same energy spectrum. Uh, so, of course, you discuss now what's going on. How can you actually know what's inside of the box and how can you even understand what is happening here? And it turns out that after discussing a little bit, you realize that there is a map that you can do between the two different degrees of freedom and systems and Hamiltonian that you have written down. In particular, this is the mapping. Uh, but let's just focus on a few cases just to see what's going on. So let's take this particular case. Somehow what your friend called the spin Z4 uh, actually for you corresponds to the product of all your spin sites um, and, and in the direction of X. And what your friend called in the X direction for the spin site number one, for instance, that is actually representing what you had as a neighboring coupling on the Z direction for your spin sites. So that's a bit weird, a bit unsettling, in particular because when we say site, you have a very clear spatial temporal notion of where things are located. And suddenly you see that what you had as site for you and for your friends seem to be quite different. Anyway, so. This, of course, is what's called a duality. And this is the Hamiltonian for each of the examples and the, the mapping between the two different modelings of the system. And the question is that, of course, under this duality, the two systems are completely equivalent um, under any possible global observable across the full system. And so, the, so you could ask, which one is it? And how can we find out what actually is inside of the box? And of course, if we, I mean, I'm talking from Stockholm. So if I was, I would go a bit south to my friends at CERN, for instance, and I would ask them to break systems, right? So if we break the box and you look inside, to some extent, that's what we are always doing when we have some sort of duality or um, uh, different alternative equivalent descriptions. We hope that we can go further inside of the system and figure out what actually is going on. The problem is that sometimes maybe we cannot open the box. And if you cannot open the box, it becomes really fuzzy to see what is better describing or what would be the physical system that uh, is inside of the box. And so in particular, we, we just saw with our simple example that even the notion of system uh, is not really clear. Uh, there are different notions of which parts are interacting. There are different notions of what are the external things that are uh, upholding our system, such as the magnetic field. And ultimately, we don't have a clear notion of um, how the different systems are even spatially distributed, which is a very classical notion that we, we take for granted. And so a lot of this talk is going to be about how do we make sense of that? How to think about, about that going from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, and then ultimately seeing what, what we have learned, how useful that can be to talk about quantum gravity. What are the shortcomings when you think about quantum gravity, uh, given um, what we know nowadays? And towards the end of the talk, we're going to see that perhaps this kind of intuition that we're developing here so far can provide a, maybe a different angle into the measurement problem that would be ultimately connecting uh, quantum gravity and what we know of it so far to the difficulties that we have to understand really what's happening in the measurement in quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's start very pedestrian and let's go to classical mechanics and let's develop our intuition very slowly there. So first of all, what's a system in classical mechanics? And typically, if you open a book on classical mechanics, um, usually you're going to start looking at systems by thinking about a single particle. And the system of the particle is going to be basically seen as the phase space associated with that particle. And typically, different points in phase space are going to be, think, be thought of the different states of a particle. Um, but of course, a different way to think about a system is to think about its um, physical properties or characteristics, which is really like what we mean by observables. And in the context of classical mechanics, 
Our observables are simply functions that take points in phase space, Q and P, uh, into numbers, into real numbers. And those functions are usually taken to be real infinitely differentiable functions. So those are the observables. And by putting together all those different functions, we have the algebra of observables in classical mechanics. And so this is the algebra of real valued smooth functions, which are defined on phase space. So having that language, we can now think a bit more precisely what we mean by state. So as I said, typically, initially, we think about the state as points in phase space. But really, uh, another way to think about state is basically that states are the things that take our observables into those numbers that we actually uh, measure. So we can think about states as linear functionals. And in particular, uh, there is a direct con connection between those of um, those, th that way of thinking about states to actually what we do in statistical mechanics in terms of thinking about expectation values of observables. Because in one way or another, typically, we are unable to prepare exactly the same state that's going to give rise to the exactly same outcome for a given observable, either because of imprecision of the experiment, which, are, which is always there, or fundamentally, which seems to be the case in quantum mechanics. So at the end of the day, really what we do, even in classical mechanics, is that we talk about expectation values of observables. And so here you have the typical formula define expectation value, not so important. But then under these particular lenses, we actually see that even in classical mechanics, what we mean by a point in phase space is the analog of what we call a pure state, while when you have regions of space phase space here in a discrete sense is what we mean by a mixed state in classical mechanics. So, okay, so now we have the idea of what was, um, what is a system. Uh, we have a refined idea of how to think about states. And now you can try to think about subsystems. And the reason to think about subsystems is that in part, even more so than classical mechanics in quantum mechanics, it's quite important to have this notion of independent subsystems, right? And we're going to see that there are basically two different ways of trying to think about subsystems. One is to start to start off with a big system and then somehow be able to factorize it. So we would expect that we can start with a big phase space and somehow there is a way to define uh, sub phase spaces and there is a way to define some sort of product that when we bring them together again, we can compose them into the initial uh, big system that we start uh, with. But the notion of independence, as we just introduced this idea of having expectation values which are connected with probabilities uh, given um, by the uncertainty that can happen around our uh, state, um, is that we can also use probability theory to maybe give the intuition of what we mean by independence in the context of subsystems. And so basically in probability, as you know, we have independence of, of, of events whenever the joint probability can be decomposed as a product of the marginal probabilities for uh, two different events uh, to happen. So in this case, we can think about the two different events as being the measurement. So there is the joint probability of associated with the both measure, measurements happen as a, as a joint measurement being decomposed as independent um, probabilities of each measure uh, happening. And so we can we can try to see if this gives us what we mean by or gives us a nice idea of independence in the in the context of classical quantum QFT and maybe uh, quantum gravity. Okay, so let's keep pushing the agenda in the classical case. Let's imagine that we start with a big phase space M, which has a set of observables F and has a particular state W, and we want to somehow identify subsystems here, right? So Let's imagine that there is two sets of observables, subsets F1 and F2, and one and two are going to be the things that are going to be defining subsystem one and subsystem two. But so, so far, can I, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Um, it can't, in the classical case, can't you just define independent subsystems through commuting observables via the Poisson? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to basically. Oh, right. That's that's what happened. Yeah. All right. I see. Right. No, I won't. I won't ever mention that. But it's good that you observe that. I guess at some point there's going to be a summary of uh, classical quantum and QFT, and then we can actually make that point. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, yeah. So I, what you just said, of course, is very good. But the point is how to get there, and so we're, we're still not there yet. 
Yeah, same thing. Yeah. So here, I'm just thinking that there is a you no know, global classical system, and we have those observables. And I would hope to be able to select a subset of them to talk about subsystem one and another subset to be subsystem two. But I still don't know how to do that. I just know how to compute joint correlators like this. And then it turns out that what you can do, the idea is that can I now define other states, omega one and omega two, such that I can decompose this initial joint correlator into independent single uh, expectation values for F1 under state W1 and for F2 under state W2. So this, making this equal to this was that notion of independence that we had from probability theory. Now the other path, which is the factorization path in which I want to define phase spaces independently for each subsystem one and two, then I would imagine that now for each phase space of each subsystem, I have the algebra that we could call already the local algebra associated with that subsystem. And I'm gonna be throughout the talk, always having a tilde whenever I go to the notion of things defined for a smaller system and for the local algebra and for the local states. And then I could hope to be able to write down this particular independence relationship between the different specification values of the subsystems, which is the same as we had before, but now with tildes, because it's defined from the point of view of the smaller phase spaces. And of course, the hope is that this box, all those things are equal. So with what I start as joint measurements defined in terms of the global observables can be seen as independent measurements is still defined in terms of the global observables with the global states. And there would be an isomorphism under which I can represent that in terms of local observables with local states. And if those things are equal, then I satisfied my property to say that not only there is this independence between different measurements and states I can prepare for each subsystem, but I can also think of each subsystem as a system by itself. And I can define everything locally with those tildes. Okay, so that was intuition. That's kind of like what we want to achieve in general. And so this is it. So this is our abstract prescription going from global joint observables to global uh, um, single expectation values across each subsystem to an isomorphism in which you can talk everything only from the point of view of a subsystem without referring to anything global. So this would be the idea that we have a sort of clear independence and notion of an independent subsystem. And we just saw that for classical mechanics, we can do that. So we just instantiate that for our Fs. And this is basically what you German was saying. We can do that by the Cartesian product. That's what we do. So the Cartesian product allows us to define an isomorphism from the global algebra here to the local algebra defined for each uh, independent phase space. And in particular, this when you do this, you define this, uh, this whole set of abelian von Neumann algebras that gives the commuting structure that we have in classical mechanics. Um, so that's how we can enable, and that's how we actually could think about classical mechanics. In fact, maybe we can make a short observation. You could see this talk almost as an, uh, a defense or an exposition of what we could be called the von Neumann paradigm of mechanics, in which we rewrite classical mechanics and quantum mechanics and QFT from this more algebraic point of view, in which we work really with this more general definition of states, and we look to the algeb algebraic properties of the observables, and then we can try to distinguish precisely what's happening from classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, and QFT, but all from the point of view of this overarching framework that we could call von Neumann framework. Okay, so we I went very slow for classical mechanics just to give a clear intuition of what's happening. We're gonna be a bit faster as we keep progressing. So let's go to quantum mechanics. How, how, do, how do things work in quantum mechanics? And to understand that better, we have to understand first how actually space, our spatial notions coming from classical mechanics impinge into our quantum descriptions. So we're gonna to try to do that a bit slowly. So we saw this mysterious box before, and basically the idea was that if we had quantum systems that are 
only described by their global Hilbert space, by their global state, and their global Hamiltonian, we might not be able to fully characterize all its classical properties. Remember, in particular, that we didn't have any more the clear notion of site, which is the location space of the different subsystems. And this is a bit puzzling, because that's not usually what happens if I go to the lab, right? If I go to the lab, I build things, I, I place my spin system, my, my spin chain in a way that is very, I'm very clearly imparting my classical notions of location on however I'm going to describe that system. So for instance, whenever we have a spin chain for every spin site localized at some position i, I will assign a C2 Hilbert space factor. And then the global, the global Hilbert space is going to just be the tensor factorization of all those different uh, C2 Hilbert spaces for each spin site. And this is really a general attitude, right? That's how we learn quantum mechanics as well. We typically assign a Hilbert space, H system, to each classical subsystem. So we have already a very clear notion of what's our classical subsystem, which is like something I can actually, you know, move it around. And then I uh, define uh, the quantum counterpart to that system as a Hilbert space. And so we already can see intuitively that some notion of space, to some extent, some notion of location in space, seems to leak into our quantum mechanical description. And we can be a bit more explicit how that happens. So let's go back to the lab as we start off. And you can consider that now you have an extended quantum mechanical system, which is divided in two parts, A and B, and they have a global Hilbert space H. They can be inter interacting or not, very much like the spins that we had in our box. Now let's set up that we, of course, have also a clock against the wall, and we have all sorts of different apparatuses that can take measurements both on A or B, which is part of this global quantum system. So, of course, all the different apparatus are defined in the local algebra observables that you can act upon our subsystems. And so the clock here is really somehow to uh, set up kind of like a reference frame for the entire lab in a very intuitive way. I want to really dive deep into uh, QRS in this talk. But the point of having the, the, the clock is to say that at any fixed time in the lab, these two parts of the system are space-like separated. And so you would expect that measurements on A do not affect your measurements on B and vice versa, at least within the time interval that light takes to travel between the systems. And this is typically what we're going to call macrocausality. It actually is a more operational view of what we would call macrocausality when you go to the lab. And so essentially what we want is to ensure that somehow the statistics associated with each of those parts are going to be independent. And this is the operational notion of macrocausality. So for example, um, if you take the statistics associated with any observable in part A, which is going to be given by expectation value of those observable, which is going to be the trace of the density matrix times observable. Um, we can also think about these statistics now uh, for the system B. And you can think about two different measurements, one in each part of the system, and so which defines two different space-time separated events, uh, space-like separated events. And we know that each measurement on its own will update the state of the global system. But still, the statistics associate which of those parts should remain independent in, under this notion of operational macrocausality. So once you make a measurement on A, for instance, you would expect that the state's now updated from row to row prime. But nonetheless, the statistics for B shouldn't change. And so here I wrote for A. So basically, if B makes a measurement and updates to row prime, still the statistics for A should not change. So expectation value of OA under, under the state rho or under the state rho prime should be the same if they're space-like separated. And so if you impose this should be true for all the observables OA and for all the observables o, OB, you, uh, you arrive that this equality is true if and only if all the observables in A commute with all the observables in B. And so we go from what we called operational macrocausality to the commensurability of the different observables of the different systems. And vice versa, it's an if and only if proof uh, that you can actually check by yourself. And so you see that space somehow was hidden in quantum mechanics because uh, it came all the way from our classical operational macrocausality notion that led into the computation of the different observables. I know that probably this is quite, uh, you're all familiar with that, but I just want to make things very explicit. 
And in fact, as you know, to some extent, we can generalize this argument uh, to think about some algebra associated with arbitrarily causally disconnected space-time regions, not only finite quantum systems. And then we are going to call this notion macrocausality instead of like the commensurability of observables. Now, this notion of having this commensurability of observables is quite important. Um, as we saw already, the physical intuition uh, now of what we meant by macrocausality and this space, spatial temporal independence of the systems has been encoded there. And in fact, if you had that notion in a context in which you have a fine dimensional Hilbert space and you have a collection of subalgebras of all those observables corresponding to each subsystem, such that they satisfy those three different properties. So we have what we call local accessibility, which means that each subset of those observables um, corresponds to a controllable observable given for uh, attributes to a particular system. There is a notion of subsystem independence that we derived, which is a consequence of this operational macrocausality. And furthermore, we assume a sort of completeness notion that the, there's a minimal inclusion of all those observables that gives rise to an isomorphism uh, of the full algebra defined over the full uh, quantum system. So if all those three properties are in place, then this is completely equivalent to the notion of having a tensor product structure. So a tensor product structure uh, here, curly tau or T of a Hilbert space is an equivalence class of isomorphism in which we can break your Hilbert space globally into factors of a Hilbert space such that for any two particular unitaries that are factorizing a Hilbert space, whenever the product of one with inverse of the other can be written as a local unitary, such as this one, for instance, or permutation of subsystems, then we are inside the same tensor product structure. So not so much, uh, not so relevant. Um, the fact that there's equivalence class is quite important, but just think about that we can decompose the Hilbert space in different, different ways, and that gives the rise, the notion of, gives rise to the notion of a, having a product, now a tensor product on the Cartesian product that we had in classical mechanics. Okay, so now we did the homework for quantum mechanics and we can also write something like this that we have here that we wanted to do for quantum mechanics. The difference is now that what we do, we had our global algebra associated with bound, uh, come, given by the, the set of bound operators defined on the Hilbert space, which is now mapped into this um, local algebra associated with a particular factor of a Hilbert space. So here you see that we had the label A defined for, as a, defining a subset of all the possible bound operators associated with subsystem A. And now we define the bounded um, operator algebra of a Hilbert space factor, H A tilde. So we do this exchange between the global observables to the full set of observables defined on a smaller Hilbert space now. And now we were able to define a notion of quantum subsystem by using the tensor product. All right, so we made more progress and now we want to talk about QFT. And of course, QFT is also quantum mechanics. So the idea is that we want to do something similar to what we did for quantum mechanics. The difference is that now uh, we're talking about infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces and you have a net of subalgebras as opposed to independent algebras that we can talk about. So the question is really, how we even define those observables in QFT. And of course, there is a lot to be talked about there, but I want to focus on a simple example to show that as soon as we have gauge theories, the situation becomes a bit more convoluted. Okay, so let's jump into QFT. Let's look to a particular example of QED coupled with a scalar field. It's a very simple QFT. You have the free term for the electromagnetic interaction. You have the gauge fixing term. We have the covariant coupling uh, of the scalar field with the gauge field, and you have some mass term for the scalar field. Now, the scalar field, the free scalar field theory, of course, respects microcausality, as we learn in QFT, meaning that the commutator of phi x and phi y commutes at space like separated region. However, phi, phi x, once becomes charged under this gauge theory, it transforms as it's here. So even though the phi x and thus satisfy the microcausality condition that we want, 
it's not by itself a gauge invariant observable. And so what we'd like to have is to have an observable that's both gauge invariant and satisfies microcausality. And the question is, can we do that? And in QED, and in particular for young Mills theories in general, typically we can. We can do something which is called dressed observable or operator, which is a way to find out how to convert our initial uh, observables into gauge invariant observables that still satisfy this notion of microcausality. So here I wrote a simple example of one of those dress operators, which is here composed of a Wilson line. So they have this integration of the gauge field connecting one phi x to a phi star. So you have you could think of a basically connecting a particle and an antiparticle of the scalar field with a Wilson line defined by the gauge field. And as long as this x and y now defining this dxi, this dress operator, if you commute this with a dwz such that x and y are space-like separated from z and w, it's going to commute. So it could be that whatever we mean by when we make observations and measurements in the concept of QED, actually that those are the observables that we are uh, having access to experimentally. And so we can do that in, in general. There are different ways of dressing the observables and different uh, physical um, situations that they are instantiating. And that's typically true for any gauge theory, uh, young, young immune theories. And so to some extent, then we complete our table. Uh, we need to rely on this notion of microcausality or Einstein separability for QFT. Uh, but now defined for observables that are gauge invariant. There is another property that I won't talk about, but I'm happy to talk about that during the questions if you want to talk about this, which is called the speed property. And we need those two properties together to be true in QFT to then to be able to go from al algebra uh, defined on a space-time region U for acting on the global Hilbert space to be able to find an isomorphism in which we can associate a Hilbert space locally to that space-time region. And that's quite interesting, right? Because so typically it's very hard in, in QFTs to talk about Hilbert spaces locally. But if you have those properties in place, at least as long as you're talking about a bipartite decomposition of the full space-time, then you can still think about having a local Hilbert space defined as long as those properties are in place. And then once you have this decomposition, you kind of like recover the tensor product structure between some space right time region U against its complement. And then you can do normal quantum mechanics. And to some extent, that's what we are doing when you do quantum mechanics in the lab. If we really think that fundamentally everything is field theory, and gauge theory, so on and so forth. So anyway, so as a summary, uh, intuition goes a long way, right? We start off with this idea of independence of events to talk about independent measurements. And now we were able to instantiate this notion at every level that we are familiar with, like from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics and QFT, and quantum classical mechanics with the Cartesian product and abelian algebras, quantum mechanics with the tensor product, product with non-abelian algebras typically, and in quantum field theory, now having to be able to define and also rely on gauge invariants to define our observables. So that's great. Uh, we've done quite a lot, and maybe it's a good place to stop to see if there are any questions. Um, so it's fully consistent to construct those dressed observables in QED, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we might have discussed this earlier, but what about linearized gravity? Yeah, we're going to get there. All right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So this was this whole initial. 35 minutes was basically introduction, right? We're just setting up the stage to talk about what we really want to talk about. And so basically what do we care about, right? What do I care about in particular? <clears throat> okay, so we developed all this formalism or we review this formalism. So now let's look to at least two physical situations, systems that I would like to understand better. Um, and the first one, one of them goes back to cosmology and we have in cosmology the cosmology the, the cosmic microwave background i'm sure as most people know is this um, radiation map of the early universe 
Um, it shows that right now there is this um, background of radiation with approximately the temperature of uh, 2.7 Kelvin, all those different fluctuations of order to, of 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin. And it's really this aged portrayal of the uh, very early universe that we have access to. Now, what's fascinating about this is that, as I said, it is it has a particular um, temperature in average, but the fluctuation around this temperature is particularly small. It's of order 10 to the minus 5. And it's pretty much a, uh, it's our, actually our best measured black body um, um, spectrum, as far as I, I, as far as I know. Um, and to arrive at a black body spectrum like that, you assume typically that there was a plenty of time to thermalization, that all those different regions of the universe somehow were in contact with for quite some time, and they could thermalize over time. In particular, if we take the North Pole and the South Pole, when we make observations and we detect the cosmic microwave background, we would expect that they had plenty of time to interact, and we'd like to talk about those different regions as if they were um, somehow independent systems, right? So we want to do what we typically were talking about so far, that to say that somehow there, there was they are seen as independent systems, meaning that we can think about local algebras associated to each of those different regions of the sky, and that somehow they could um, thermalize. But that's not true. Uh, without assuming any particular um, fancy uh, early universe model, such as inflation, those two regions were not uh, actually ever in thermal contact or any sort of uh, contact. They're space-like separated. In fact, when you look to the sky, every other two degrees in the sky, if I'm not mistaken, without inflation would be space-like separated at the early universe. And so there is no clear reason why you'd expect that those two regions were uh, in, in thermal contact uh, throughout the history of the universe, unless something else has happened. But this, of course, is born out of the out of the idea that those two regions are independent. And typically, to even motivate us to talk about inflation, relies on this idea that we can define those particular opera, um, algebra operators that are associated with different regions of the night sky, basically. So this is a motivation. Like, can can we do that? Like, is there a clear reason that we can think about different patches of the sky of of the universe as independent? quantum subsystems, as we've been doing so far, as we did for classical quantum in QFT. Okay, so that's our first example that we should keep in mind. Second one is, of course, very popular these days, which is the GIE experiments by uh, introduced by Bose, Malet and Vendrao, the BMV experiment. This is a picture from Bose's paper. Um, and typically, as you know, the idea is that if we could have two masses superimposed only interacting through gravity. And we could then witness if they get entangled or not after they only interact through their gravitational uh, interaction. This would be a test of gravity being uh, potentially seen as a quantum mediator. Um, so of course we can even look to the math of what they've been using uh, at least at the early days to describe this sort of experiment. Basically, you see that there is a global initial state, which is represented by an initial state on the mass one, superimposed between positions left and right, times the state of mass two, superimposed between states left and right. And at some time later, by interacting only through the Newtonian uh, interaction, each of those different um, states pick up a different phase both through the gravitational interaction, uh, producing an entangled state. And so this is quite uh, you know, simple, and there is plenty of work uh, around those experiments. Um, the reason why I'm interested in that is because when we look to this initial state and this modeling of the system, clearly there are two things that are happening here. Um, first of all, there is... Uh, tensor product structure here, which is assumed to be existent for the composing or for the composing system one, system two into the full quantum system. 
And there is another assumption on the Mishu state that not only you have a tensor product structure, but also you have a product state that you can somehow think of your initial state into uh, defined as a product state and you can model it, the whole evolution, uh, having this starting point. So there are two notions of independence here. The notion that there is a decomposition of the quantum system into subsystems and that you can find uncorrelated states uh, for those subsystems. <clears throat> so that's our second example in mind. And of course, both examples now bring about the, the, the new feature that we are not only talking about cage theories, uh, but we're talking about gravity. So we have now quantum gravitational systems that we want to describe. And so despite some level of contention as usual, usual, as I said, those are two examples that we could argue they are low energy quantum gravity uh, in nature. So as we know, cosmological perturbations, they are defined in terms of the matter and geometrical degrees of freedom. And when we're doing inflation, for instance, that those are the degrees of freedom that we quantize to explain the spectrum that we have on the CMB. While the GAE experiments, they're really locally modeled in terms of exchange of gravitational quantum. And so now we arrive at the question of how can we meaningfully talk about independent gravitational quantum systems in plural. So we are back to our quest, right? We want to talk about having systems in plural. They should be independent, but now they're also gravitational. So let's see what we can, what we know so far, uh, if we're very conservative. Being very conservative means that we're going to lose, look to linearized um, quantum gravity, so or low energy quantum gravity. Uh, and you can just think again, I'm now having a theory cup with a scalar field to build on the uh, intuition that we had coming from QED, as we saw before. So once again, you can write down the Lagrangian, where we couple the metric with the scalar field minimally, and we have the same story. The free scalar field would be microcausal, but under linear diffs, it's not gauge invariant. So the scalar field is going to transform under a linear diff that can be seen completely as a gauge theory at, uh, at a fixed background. And again, you can ask the question, okay, so can we define now gauge invariant observables that are going to also be microcausal? And then we're done. We're back to what we have learned so far and everything works fine. And uh, as far as we know, there is no way to come up with dressed operators that are going to be microcausal. So we can come up with dress operators that are going to be gauge invariant. This is one example of them. So basically you have a, what the linear diff is doing to the scalar field is doing a kind of like shift translation of the field. You can compensate that with those uh, unitary operators here. And then basically you have this capital phi, which is going to be gauge invariant. And inside of those um, funky operators here, you see that there is this V, U, which is a, actually a, a operator functional, which is defined in this particular way. And crucial, if you remember before in the QED example, we also had this sort of integration of the gauge field, which now appears here. Uh, we have the integration of the metric, but we have a new term. We have a term that appears also now the derivative of the metric. And we're gonna try to understand a bit better what's going on here. But really the intuition that you can have is that somehow this algebraic approach that we've been pushing forward so far is somehow obstruct uh, in gravity. Uh, an intuition that people usually um, have in mind is that somehow when you have those gravitational strings of any two operators, they can intersect no matter how far apart the points are. So we cannot really screen the gravitational field of a particle. And there is no notion of a negatively charged particle. As we did for QED, remember our dress operator, for instance, was this composite operator between a particle and a particle. So basically, in other ways that we, of course, don't have a negative point of hit charges for matter. And the key point here is that we only use this uh, local diff, linearized diff symmetries to make the argument. So you could expect that any theory, any quantum gravity theory that has a low energy limit in which we arrive at linearized gravity a la Einstein, and we have a 
covariantized way of quantizing the theory, sorry, a canonical way of quantizing the theory, we derive the same problem. And so we seem to have a problem no matter what. And to understand a bit better what's going on to some extent is that typically that kind of operator that we have used for dressing our observables had this integration of the gauge field, which is the connection. And of course, in normal gauge theories, the gauge field is the connection. And we quantize the gauge field, therefore we're quantizing the connection. But for canonical energy quantum gravity, we do not quantize the connection, we quantize the metric. And so that integration that had the H and derivative of H there was actually an integration of the connection. Had we, inter- had we quantized the connection instead, we wouldn't have run into this problem. So the problem is coming from the fact that at the way that we canonically quantize gravity, we have the gauge field, which is the connection, but we quantize the metric, not the gauge field. And therefore, when we do the commutation relationships, at some point, the metric is going to be hitting on its derivative, which is its conjugate momentum. And then, of course, by Heisenberg canonical commutation relationships, that does not commute. And that's the reason why we do not arrive at a gauge invariant microcausal set of observables in low energy quantum gravity. And as I said, from an effective field theory perspective, we do live in this regime in which low energy quantum gravity applies. In fact, uh, more poetically, if you using Rovelli's words, I mean, really bar, bars and clocks are the tools that measure the line element, thanks to their coupled uh, with their gravitational field. Everything that we're measuring is at this regime, and that's the that's why we have an issue, because we are obstructed to follow what we did for our normal QFT. So just to build, a, just to recover our intuition from the beginning or to talk about uh, what is happening now, like to some extent you could think that our questions that we had at the beginning when we thought about the box was how do we find out what's the system inside the box? What happens if you cannot open the box? But from to some extent, what's really happening when you think about all of these in the context of gravity, is almost as if we are inside of the box and we're unable to really recover what would be the global picture. So a bit more precise, it is that if we go back to our classical mechanics diagram, low energy quantum gravity seems to be kind of stuck here. And we have a problem of actually talking about subsystems going from the global picture to the local picture. Of course, you should be a bit suspicious now because we still go to the lab, we make experiments and we make those assumptions and everything works out. And so it is still unclear uh, what is the right way to think about that in the context that everything is coupled to gravity. Nonetheless, we go to the labs and we are able to model experiments as if we have those gauge invariant commuting observables for different space-like separated systems. And I think it's uh, it will it's one of the tasks that we have to develop the framework in which that can be understand understood properly. Okay, so now let's uh, use this intuition or this uh, breakdown of. Can I can I ask a brief yeah. question? Yeah. If um, the new ice gravity permits these, um, or if the only consistent way of doing it is to have non-local observables, or to, to allow for non-local observables, that does that have implications for the gravitational induced entanglement experiments? Where in those um, proposals they require the assumption of locality to infer quantization, yeah. but if it's perfectly consistent to have these non-local observables, then it should be. Uh, yeah, so the I mean I think there is different way there are different things one can say in that context, and I'm happy to discuss more about this maybe towards the end of the talk. Yeah, yeah. But just a, a quick remark is more that even if you decide to model the experiments as people have been doing so far at this quantum info level, then to go from that modeling to derive conclusions about the metric field. And one has to be careful. So mm-hmm. one thing is to remain at the level where you are consistent in your description and you can write down things such as sensor product structures, product states, so on and so forth. But then once you do that and you witness entanglement, to then go and say, ah, what's actually happening is that I have a 
cat for my metric and my metric is superimposed and stuff like that. All of that is relying on the fact that somehow you can separate your method of user freedom from your geometric user freedom. That there is a tensor product structure that allows you to take a field, which is a metric, and put inside a cat and write down a product state for it. And so those conclusions for me um, at this level, they seem to be a bit um, too fast. Yeah, and I mean, uh, it's we need to um, redefine the tensor product structure so that, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, there is more to be talked about that as well. So I'm happy to uh, do that at the end. Okay, so we're approaching the end. I think I have roughly 10 minutes, more or less. Um, I will try to not go much over time. So I want now to use this to maybe bring a new perspective on the measurement problem. And let's start with a reminder. So let's go back to Heisenberg. And these you can find also in the introduction of uh, class Lanzmann's book on foundation of quantum theory. So Heisenberg would say that the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory starts from a paradox. In experimenting physics, whether it refers to the phenomena of daily life or to atomic events, it should be described in terms of the classical physics. So the concepts of classical physics form the language by which we describe the arrangement of our experiment and state the results. Remember, right, we saw at the beginning that there was this whole notion of spatial-temporal things impinging our quantum mechanics. Or maybe in more modern ways, uh, Landman says the physically relevant aspects of the non-commutative operator algebras of quantum mechanical observables are only accessible through commutative algebras. So what really they have in mind here is that even though we did all this work, somehow we seem to be constrained at this level. I mean, we can model the, our experiments as quantum systems and our observables as quantum systems, but really what we have access to are things that we move around in the classical world where they have those abelian algebras associated with it. So everything else somehow is inferred. It's under this classical hood that we have access to. So given that, now we can start asking the question of why should we expect that our classically induced quantum factorizations should be preserved over time, including over measurements? So why should we expect that our notions of quantum systems based on this higher level classical physics that we have access to should be fixed, should be invariant, right? And so now I'm going to try to sketch a proposal based on what we have learned about low energy quantum gravity that could maybe lead into uh, some notion of single world unitary quantum mechanics, not many world, but single world. And maybe you can see how that works. So we started by realizing, as we saw, that this breakdown of microcatalyzity in low energy quantum gravity, and therefore the subsequent loss of well-defined tensor product structure undermines the concept of having absolute quantum gravitational subsystems, which is due to the universal nature of gravity, which the, the, because of the nature, universal nature of gravity would apply to everything, all systems. And so this perhaps could offer a new perspective on the measurement problem, in which quantum subsystems are not invariant anymore under measurements nor generic Hamiltonian evolution. So different than classical subsystems, which are literally anchored in space-time and mostly preserved under time evolution, their quantum counterparts would move freely within the global Hilbert space. So the situation is somehow analogous to having a fixed thermodynamical macrostate while the true system's microstate is actually roaming, roaming freely in the region of space, defining that microspace. So, of course, this is a notion of emergence that we have very uh, we have understood fairly well. And here, one step further, it's almost as if there would be the classical macrostate, while there or the classical macro system, while the quantum micro system is something that's fuzzy and not really well defined. Okay. So let's uh, sketch how that could possibly work. Let's simplify our life by having a global fine dimensional Hilbert space H with its bounded operators defined on it, some Hamiltonian H, some initial pure state rho naught. And then for each observable defined on the global Hilbert space, uh, we have its expectation value, which is time independent as the state is evolving. Um, 
and through, through the normal um, Hamiltonian evolution. And so if you take the set of all those expectation values of all the variables, we have fully parameterized all the data of the theory. And the theory evolves deterministically, right? There is nothing more that we can know or, or do with this theory. Moreover, this set of expectation, expectation values at any given um, tau naught, which is the parameter that is defining our Hamiltonian evolution, is invariant under any unitary map, in particular the unitary maps that break down the Hilbert space, the global H, into factors HI. The same map is the thing that can now rewrite our observables and also rewrite our states. So this is really what we talked about before uh, as having a tensor product structure. Okay, now let's consider that we have some particular subalgebra up, which is associated with our apparatuses, our experimental devices. And so we have our observables O app, and they define the set of all of those observables define some ortho orthogonal basis for our apparatus. And let's assume, at least for now, that our apparatuses are somehow independent quantum systems, that there is a notion of microcausality holding. I have my surrounding apparatuses around me, and I can define, as we saw in QFT, for instance, or in quantum mechanics, a notion in which there is my Hilbert space associated with all my apparatuses, as opposed to everything else. So now we have the Hilbert space of the apparatuses, tensor everything else, and this is isomorphic to our initial uh, global algebra. Needless to say, the dimensionality of the Hilbert space of everything else is much, much, much bigger than the one associated with my apparatuses. So it's nice because now, typically we don't have access to the whole Hilbert space anyways, and we want to be able to single out our apparatus. And that's what I said that is, uh, is a TPS. So this T that we had before is breaking the Hilbert space into the Hilbert space of our apparatus versus everything else. It's giving an isomorphism between the global observables for the apparatus in the local observable of the apparatus defined on the local Hilbert space. Within this bipartite decomposition, we can use the Schmidt decomposition to rewrite the initial state in terms of the basis of one particular base for the apparatus and another basis for everything else. Also, we can fully parameterize the most general Hamiltonian uh, ruling the evolution between the apparatus and everything else. In terms of those coefficients, you have a free term for the apparatus, a free term for the uh, for everything, everything else. We have a global term for the uh, spectrum plus interactions. So another way of thinking of having this tensor product structure is to forget that we had a tensor product structure and to think of all the different coefficients we just introduced. There are the coefficients that are now modeling the factorization of the state and all different coefficients modeling the Hamiltonian evolution. So once you have those coefficients, you're defining a tensor product structure. And you could remain, even if you keep the factorization fixed, but you vary the coefficients, is the same as actually varying factorization and, and keeping the coefficients uh, the same. So if you do that, I haven't done anything fancy so far, you can use the TPS to rewrite our initial expectation values defined in terms of the global observables to now be written in terms of the local observables. And so these now V tilde are the local invariants associated with the local observables for the local Hilbert space of the apparatus. And so, and this is always true that the global invariants can be decomposed as convex sum of local invariants. So I haven't done anything so far. I'm just like really showing to you uh, very slowly how the tensor product structure kind of works. And now we're going to introduce some three crucial assumptions. And this is a sketch of a program, a research program, really. We would have to be able to prove those assumptions that they are reasonable. And the first one is to say that, as I said, the dimensionality of the Hilbert space associated with apparatus is much smaller than everything else, which for sure is the case. This leads to the idea that there are many inequivalent tensor product structures. And in fact, they are all connected by global unitaries that can be typically um, continuous, continuously parametrized, which is another way of saying that any, any two TPS can be somehow related by continuous deformation and parametrized by some parameter tau 
So you can go from one tensor product structure to another tensor product structure in a continuous way. Now there is a preferred set of tensor product structure. Let's call it TM, where the state of the system factorizes in a very particular way, it becomes separable. So suddenly I have now this prime that's indicating whenever we are under one of those TPSs uh, M, such that we disentangle completely the apparatus and everything else. And now, crucially, due to violation of microcausality in quantum gravity, imposing a fixed tensor product structure in any quantum gravitational system is actually ill-posed, as we saw before. And so we should take that as an approximation. As the system evolves under the global Hamiltonian, the approximate TPS would be changing continuously and parameterized by this parameter tau. So really, if you don't want to think in terms of the TPS, you can think about the Hamiltonian coefficients that we saw before. And basically, the Hamiltonian coefficients are not fixed. They are always evolving. This is the same as not having a fixed tensor product structure. So basically what low energy quantum gravity would be telling us is that if we fix tensor product structure, the Hamiltonian evolution and the coefficients modeling the Hamiltonian evolution, they're actually not fixed over time. If you put all those assumptions together, which they have to be scrutinized much more in the future, then you can show that single outcomes in any measurement simply corresponds to a composition of a change of this tensor product structure together with a local unitary transformation of the local algebra assigned to the apparatus. And that's somewhat trivial to show. There's a few lines of math, of course, because if we now have a particular tensor product structure, TM, that disentangles the state, then of course, what we can do, we can just rotate our apparatus. Crucially, we don't know how, but we could, such that we go from this superimposed state into a single state uh, for a given observable in terms of this new tensor product structure. Um, and then, of course, you can show that our initial global expectation value associated with a particular uh, apparatus observable now can be fully written as a single outcome, a single eigenvalue of one of those uh, operators defined under this new tensor product structure. So in other words, by identifying the appropriate tensor product structure and locally aligning the apparatus, we see that any local measurement outcome is actually telling us uh, what are the global invariants that we start with. And it's just a single outcome. Um, so of course, we could, we could ask where probabilities are arising and I haven't uh, made progress on that so far, but the expectation would be that somehow the probabilistic nature of the theory now arises from our lack of knowledge about the specific set of unitaries required to reach this point. So of course I showed that that is possible, but now we have to understand how we can actually implement those unitaries. In any case, given that all the considerations involved only unitary transformations, both for the TPS updates and time evolution, in principle, we still arrive at the description of an apparatus with single outcomes, which are related to the global invariants, um, amounting to a single world unitary quantum mechanics, given that everything was always unitary here. Now to conclude, we can make a quick comparison to GR to show that actually what we're doing is not really uh, weird. So basically in GR, as one moves through space-time and wants to compare measurement at different points along their trajectory, we also have to keep updating our local inertia frames, our tetrads, based on the local metric of space-time. So there in GR, we also have three things that happen. There is a uh, isolated equations that allow us to determine the space-time metric, which despite being local equations, often require global boundary conditions for a solution. Once you have the metric, you can establish what's the family of local inertial frames using the metric. So I have the metric and here where I am, there are many different possible local inertial frames, including frames which are completely boosted in relation to myself. And then I have to figure out what is my natural tetrad frame to actually make my measurements. So we have to align the time-like tetrad with our own observers for velocity, which is a local process, which requires making measurements of the observer's relative velocity to reference points. 
In particular, if the time length that the vector wasn't aligned with the observer's Fermi velocity, it would represent a boosted frame, which is relative to the observer's rest frame. And that would lead to different local measurements of time and space, akin to what happens in special relativity, really. So it's crucial for the observer to measure their relative velocity in relation to some reference point to determine the appropriate tetrad to use. And so now to wrap up, in other words, what this is telling us is that to some extent, we are lacking something like Einstein's equation in quantum mechanics that would tell us how to update our uh, tensor product structure. And then once you do that, once you have that equation and that update, we would be able to update our notion of local uh, of local subsystems, and then to account for the measurement uh, uh, problem in a different way, by really not imposing that whatever is a quantum system is something that's always fixed, but it's actually varying over time. And yet another way, it's almost as if Schrodinger equation or Heisenberg equation, they are much more like geodesics equations, but we still lack what would be the equation defined in the local metric, in this case, the local tensor product structure. Anyways, so to conclude, I just some note here. I just want to say that I nowadays believe that over time we scrutinized quite deeply the notion of space and time. And nowadays there is a lot of people working on trying to really investigate what we mean by systems, quantum systems, quantum gravitational systems. And it could be that uh, maybe to make progress towards quantum gravity and a better understanding of um, quantum mechanics, uh, this is the work that we have to do, really to maybe let go eventually of uh, absolute notion of quantum systems. And I end it here. Thanks so much for the attention. Thanks very much for the very interesting talk. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I have, I have a, probably a very naive question about... Um, your example by dressing with the metric and then you ask gravity. Yeah. So then the obvious question, like the obvious question was, what if we dressed with the Christoffel symbols instead? That's a good question. So um, I mean, we can pull it back there. I mean, that's a proper one form, so. Yeah, that's very good. Um, right. So oh, we're all the way here. Um, I probably went too fast. Okay. Let me just close the presentation and try to open directly. Okay. The computer allows it. Okay. Cool. Um, good question. So you're basically saying, what if we do something as such as quantizing the connection, right? So yeah. I still haven't looked into that, um, but of course you would expect that to some extent, what low energy quantum gravity does is that. Um, of course, they're not quantizing the affine Christoffel connection, they're quantizing the Ashtar connection. And then there, I would expect that perhaps you don't quite run into this problem, but I haven't tried to check that. In particular, it's a bit trickier than what I said, that is simply the fact that you have the connection here, because you also have to do those no local integrations on the dressing. and mm -hmm. Even in that case, you could potentially pick up a contribution for the commutator that, um, that's not obvious from just looking to what I said. In any case, I think it's really, it's, I don't want to overstate what I'm saying. I'm, I'm showing this to be a problem with this um, canonical way of quantizing that we typically implicitly assume when we think about low energy quantum gravity. But of course, there could be perhaps other ways of seeing quantization of gravity that could avoid that. And I think mm. it would be very nice to think more about that. And of, and of course, it's all in like a uh, perturbative gravity, right? So it could be like in a non-perturbative approach, maybe this problem is not there. Absolutely. So that's a good point. So to some extent, my criticism here is more about the current philosophy that we uh, apply in the context of both GA experiments and the conclusions we could try to derive there but also in the motivation to introduce something such as inflation in cosmology. Because in inflation in cosmology, we do this, exactly the quantization that we're talking about here, we do it there. But then you should question yourself, can you even do that quantization in a way that your initial starting point in which you assume that different patches of the night sky are independent is still valid? 
because under that quantization, that assumption breaks down. And then perhaps within that assumption breaking down, you don't even need to, impo- to, to bring on inflation anymore. You could try to explain that actually those regions, they somehow, they do not commute despite being space-like separated. And then there is another way perhaps to actually thermalize the system by, quote, violating uh, causality. I suppose in the context of GIE, you could make the argument that the mediating subsystem is not really independent of the matter subsystems of the other. And then, yeah, you get right. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, like, there are other questions, right? Like, can even if you witness entanglement, what what is this entanglement telling you? Mm. In that? Um, and in particular, you could also imagine that if you take, as a matter of fact, the idea that somehow uh, the, commute, the, the, the set of local algebras do not commute, then perhaps you could actually go back and try to redefine again um, or to re-derive Bell's inequalities. And yeah. I actually, so there is a fire alarm at Nordita and apparently I have to go out. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I doubt that there is anything happening, but uh, people are telling me to evacuate. <laughs> well, we don't have it here at SU, but anyway, I'll, I'll let you get it. <laughs> yeah, I would have to answer more questions. So if more people have questions, please just feel free to email me. I'm happy to talk about any of those topics at any time. I think there is a lot to uncover here in terms of like the more foundational insights for what's going on. And maybe also uh, project ideas, such as, as I just mentioned briefly, uh, rederiving Bell's inequalities and all sort of different inequalities in a context in which you don't have a well-defined notion of subsystem anymore. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I will have to go before people freak out here. Uh, but yeah. Thank you so much right, for, for inviting me. And thanks again, for please feel free to email me if there are more questions. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, see ya.